you know, what I want to know is is how how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. The fall of 2021 had started to be a time of sort of eager anticipation. You know, this uh, this newfound conversation that I was having with this Greek woman, Helen of Greece, I call her. It was really starting to get into me and to start to um, sort of like I was having an experience and... I didn't want to talk about it too much, and I didn't tell too many people about it because it was so personal, and it was so um, important to me to protect. I felt like I was in protection mode of this because, by God, if I'm going to have another relationship in my life, then I want to get it right, and I want it to be the one. I want it to be the one that will take me on into the end. I felt like I had failed miserably at relationships in my life. And I know on some level that none of them were really failures. I know that, you know, we learn from all of them and we can take those lessons and hopefully change and not blame And I really felt like I had tried to constantly clean my side of the street. I felt like I was in constant self-realization mode. You know, I am my worst critic, and I do take my inventory probably a lot deeper and more serious than the average person because of this criticism and this, you know, this inner critic And it's hard, it's hard sometimes to not let that part of the brain just dictate and just to, you know, accept the fact that, you know, someone likes you and someone's talking to you without, like, worrying about it. But I I found myself having, you know, anxiety about it because I wanted so much for something to work out in my life. And this new, um, you know, person in my life that I hadn't met yet in person, but I felt closer to than I had felt to anybody in years. And I remember therapy lady, you know, years and years ago saying, you know, Jill, it's like you're addicted to the attraction phase of a relationship. And it used to piss me off, but, you know, she was right. I was addicted to that, and why wouldn't I be? I think we all are. Who who doesn't love being in love? And I, I, I didn't want to say that I was falling in love. I didn't want to say that because I didn't want to jinx it, and I didn't want it to, you know, blow up in my face. So I wasn't going to even go down the love road. You know, the whole myth of romantic love is... It is a myth pretty much because, you know, unless two people are whole or at least 
you know, moving forward to wholeness, it's very hard uh, when two people get together that haven't done any work on themselves. It's usually a disaster. And I don't believe that that's psychobabble. I believe there's a lot of truth to that because I've experienced it. I've been in layers of relationships of work and non-work and, you know, putting band-aids on relationships and expecting things to just be okay. And then also, you know, sweeping shit under the rug on a constant basis. You know, the relationship that I had been in for the past 12 years prior to the two years of being alone, I had just gone into this reclusive place of dimming my light and shutting myself down in order to keep peace in the household and try to make everything okay for the other person. And all it was doing was just chipping away and chipping away and chipping away at my own self-worth. And it was making me sicker and sicker. And I just hated the way I felt about myself. I wasn't taking care of myself. But by releasing that and finally, you know, moving back to Asheville. and But there was time for, you know, introspection. There was time for healing. And there was time to figure out what it is do I really want in my life. And, and I didn't have like a... a um, a relationship on my radar at all and really not until starting to work for this ex person that had been sort of a love interest did it kind of get all that going and then I was mad at myself for feeling and I beat myself up like why do I feel this way and I just wanted it all to go away and I didn't want to have any kind of attraction but I thought God you know I'm not old and so with all that you know, the fall of 2021 was looking a little brighter because it was like, you know, I was having this great conversation with this foreign woman and I was working and my work, my work was good. I had a young man working for me who seemed to be happy and liking it. And, you know, and so my friend Janet, uh, her and her husband, they had been kind of talking about their yard a lot and you know people love to pick your brain about landscape and then we would always joke around about it it's like you know what would you do in this area what would you do in this area and they had this front kind of courtyard kind of area and I was like why don't y'all just let me just do this for y'all and you know install like a Japanese garden and like really just do it and make it low maintenance and so I had this vision and and they were on board you know and During that time, they were also looking into uh, renovating their house and their kitchen. And they had met this young couple that was kind of new to Shelby. And they were... um They were kind of like organic farmer. The the guy was like an organic farmer kind of guy. And the young girl was a landscape, not a landscape, but an architectural design person. And so, you know, they, they had sort of said, oh, you should meet them. They're really cool and blah, blah, blah. And so one day when we were there, um, they, this young couple shows up. And so the guy comes walking toward me and he was a real good looking kid. He's not a kid, he's 30, but to me he's a kid and had this curly red hair and just really attractive kid and, uh, you know, tall and handsome and had a big smile. And so we introduced ourselves and just sat and talked and we all went in the house and they had a little puppy named Brewer. And, uh, and we were kind of, the dogs were all sort of playing, Minnie and Emmy and Brewer, and they're all playing, and we were just kind of sitting there talking. And and he was working at a, a, a local landscape company in Shelby, and he was telling me a little about it, his experience. And, and I was really intrigued to listen to it because my landscape life had been so many years in the making. You know, I started at such a young age in that world, and I had no idea where I was going to end up. I had no idea that I would even stick with anything like that. And he was telling me his experience, and I was sitting there listening to it, and I was kind of getting sick to my stomach because it was reminding me of those, like, early days and how in that world of, you know, 
time is money time is money it just it's it's sort of abusive it's sort of abusive to employees because they're not given a whole lot of direction but they're expected to just pull miracles out of their ass and I could hear in his voice and in his demeanor that he wasn't real thrilled about what he was doing, but he wasn't real negative about it either. He was just sort of telling what had been going on and what he was responsible for. And he seemed pretty tuned in and tapped in and he seemed pretty grounded. And, you know, I just remember thinking like, God, I wish you lived closer because I would love you to come work with me, you know, just to have somebody that I could you know, talk to and who I felt like sort of got it, you know, and I didn't know how much experience he had or anything. And it really didn't matter. The thing is, is that it you don't have to have experience in this world. It's like if you have a good teacher, then you just bring your best self forward. And, and you know, I could teach him. I felt like the more he stayed there, the more he was going to learn from them, which is going to be just bullshit most of the time. I mean, sometimes they learn, but a lot of times it's shortcuts. A lot of times it's uh, it's just about the bottom line, which is that money line. And I thought, you know, there's, you know, you want to have a little bit of passion in the work, don't you think? I mean, don't you think you want to have a little bit of creativity and a little bit of passion and a little bit of enthusiasm? Or do you just want it to be a goddamn get the money and go? And most of the time, and I maybe I'm generalizing, but most of the time, it's about get the shit done and get the money and go. And I have watched it and watched it and watched it. I watched it through my entire Atlanta landscaping career, and I had watched it for the last 21 years in Asheville. And I had watched, you know, just that whole thing and how... And, I mean, don't get me wrong. Yes, I got to make money. I need to make money. I want to make money. But I also have to, you know, put an element of care and an element of creativity into the mix. Or why in the world am I doing this? This is too physically hard to just be doing it for the money. There has to be some sort of payoff that makes sense or I cannot continue to do this. But the afternoon kind of went on and we had talked and I really enjoyed him. And I really enjoyed his girlfriend who was going to become his fiance. Maybe I think he might have already asked her to marry him. And she was just adorable and she was very smart. And they were both just really with it and... I think they had moved from Raleigh and now they were in Shelby and I think it was kind of hard for them because Shelby doesn't have a, a lot of uh, young people, um, you know, up and coming, open minded young people. I think it's a pretty conservative place. I think there's uh, groups of people there that are maybe uh, trending toward organic clean eating and and things of that that nature but I think for the most part it's still kind of behind the times especially compared to Asheville which is an hour and a half away but you know it's just like in Atlanta it's like there was Atlanta and then there was like Ackworth you know what I'm saying or you know it was this two different worlds you know 45 minutes north of Atlanta was like a just a crazy backward Woodstock kind of way. Not Woodstock, New York, but Woodstock, Georgia, which was kind of compared to, you know, Paulden County and Dallas, Georgia, which those places now are just suburbs of Atlanta. I mean, hell, the suburbs now go to like Dahlonega, which is like about an hour from the North Carolina line. It's crazy. But all of that, you know, I had a lot to think about after that couple left and Janet and Don and I, you know, we sat and we talked. And the thing about Janet and Don is they they really helped me to just sit down and relax. I had not sat with people and had conversations in so long. And going down to their house on the weekends and going out on the boat and hanging out with, you know, the dogs and just having this kind of fun time was really, it was really special and sometimes, you know, when you're when you're in that, you don't realize 
what kind of good time you're having. You know, you kind of uh, go on. I've got many, my Shih Tzu, who's digging right now in the, the bedspread. And I'll just let this play out because I think she wants to be on the podcast. She was in, you know, uh, she was in the first couple of seasons. There were a couple of times where... <laughs> I just let it rip. I just let her dig. Shih Tzus have this thing where they have to, um, they kind of, they call them the emperor's foot warmer. You know, it's a, it's a Tibetan thing. And they kind of have to dig and make them a nest. And, uh, and she sort of knows when I'm recording. And I think she has to say her two cents worth, which is like, I'm right here and I want to be remembered in this thing. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, when Hammered is out still in the world somewhere and we're both gone into the ethers, into the next dimensions of whatever, um, it'll be kind of funny to listen and hear this Shih Tzu scratching. So sometimes you just got to let things play its, you know, you just got to let things run its course. And... uh but that night after the kids, after those that young couple left, um, Janet and Don, and we sat around and we talked about stuff, and I decided to go. And, you know, the, the fun part was that I had, uh, I felt like I had a, I felt like I had a companion in my pocket with my phone. I felt like Helen of Greece was sort of living in my phone, and I had her there all the time. Because she would check in with me and, you know, we would kind of text periodically throughout the day. And it had grown a little bit more. And, um, you know, she told me that, you know, you can text me anytime. And she said, you know, you have my permission. And she laughed and I laughed. I said, permission? And, um, you know, we, we talked about travel again. And she said, you know, not everybody enjoys not everybody like enjoys the idea of stepping out, you know, out of the usual. And uh, when she would ask me if I love to travel, and she said, you know, she'd been to most parts of Europe and Brazil, Costa Rica, Chile, Colombia. Um, she said, I've not been to the Asian countries yet, but my dream is to visit China and Japan and Turkey. And I love Egypt. Uh, she said, I am, you know, quite fascinated about the Asian culture. It's very beautiful. And I love that. And the reason that came up is because I told her that we were planning to do this sort of Japanese garden. It wasn't going to be like total Japanese garden. I'm not Japanese for one thing, but I do have a, a pretty strong vision. And I, t I was telling her uh, that Janet and Don were going to kind of give me free license to create this for them and and she was saying you know it is it is so uh important you know your imagination creates these images because i told her you know that i dreamed my work a lot of times and i just saw these visions and and she says you are so lucky to have that jill you know you are a visionary and it is very important that you you take these images and you put them out there you know that's your imagination at work and um and so it just felt so good to have somebody. I felt like I had somebody on my team and I felt like I had somebody that was in support of the things that I talked about. And she was really interested. And I never had anybody that was that interested in my work. I just hadn't. I mean, my real estate friend that I talked about a lot, you know, she's really cool and she has a vision and, and, you know, we had done a lot of work at her house and, and she was pretty cool about letting me just go at it and stuff. And, but she's so busy, you know, she never really had time to really process or talk to me that much. And with Helen, there was just, you know, she made time and she was super busy. And I know that she was very tired because she said, you know, her work was very taxing and that she had to really, really withdraw sometimes on the weekend and just really, you know, have that downtime and and uh, listen to music and, and relax. And 
And so I, I sort of laughed and I gave her permission, quotation, permission to text me anytime. And I told her, you know, I said, ask me anything. I'm an open book. And she laughed and said, you know, you make me smile, babe. And she called me babe. And it just like made my heart like skip, you know. And uh, and I ended up, I sent her the podcast um and then she said, you know, I will save the link and listen later, you know, because I want to be able to to really settle and to listen and enjoy. Um, and I was kind of relieved, mainly because of the wine slash alcohol thing. I hadn't told her that I didn't drink. And I was really scared because I thought, you know, if I tell her I'm like a recovering alcoholic at 36 years, you know, that might be a deal breaker. And some of my friends I had kind of told a little bit about this. They were like, you know what? If it's a real connection, it won't be a deal breaker, Jill. And so there was part of me that was sort of worried about it. And then there was another part of me that was like, you know, this person has a lot more depth than that. And I don't think that she's going to be all like, you know, freaked out about it or anything. But, you know, Europeans, they don't, uh, they don't seem to have the alcohol problems like we do in the United States, or at least you don't hear about it. Um, you don't hear about all the treatment centers and all the damn shit that goes along with that destruction. I just don't think that they uh, focus on it like we do here. I don't know because I don't, I've never been there, but I've heard things. I've heard that, you know, in Italy, they've just got wine on the table and the kids drink wine. I just, you know, so she had mentioned a few things here and there about having a glass of red wine. and But she didn't seem like, you know, somebody that was just constantly drinking wine because she was super busy. Um, and so, you know, she told me that she was really open-minded. And, uh, and her email was actually, she gave me her email, and the email was actually Neutral Cord was her email uh name without the rest of it but um, I asked her I was like what is that what do you mean by that and she told me that she was neutral on many topics that people tend to argue about like politics and religion and status quo um, you know and I, I had kind of hinted that I had a colorful past and she assured me that she didn't judge you know, and the word normal was also an opinion. She laughed and she even said, you know, normal implies that you have to be and act a certain way. And she went on to tell me that she had always been the, re the rebellious one in her family and that maybe she, um, maybe she wasn't the normal one. Um, you know, Helen said, I, I remember she said, I have a mind of my own and I'm not very big on following rules, especially if my spirit doesn't accept it. And that really stuck with me. I thought this languaging is just everything that I want to hear. I love it. My spirit doesn't accept it. Like who says that? Helen of Greece says it. You know, I told her I was pretty much the black sheep of my family, um, and I kind of explained, and, and she knew what black sheep was. What was funny is that some of the things that we would talk about, I could tell there was a um, sort of a, I could tell when she didn't quite understand it, and sometimes she just asked me, what does that mean? Um, you know, and, and that was interesting because I just assume that people know what certain things mean. And so sometimes I, and I, I kind of started getting a habit of saying, do you know what I mean? And, and I think I say that a lot anyway, but then I felt like I was really saying it a lot. And then I thought, Jill, quit asking her that. You know, I was so uh, micromanaging my own languaging because I didn't want to screw it up, you know. And, and so... Um, as we were talking, you know, um, I would shift the conversation and finally I just point blank ask her. I said, so what are you looking for on online dating, Helen? And, you know, she sat there quiet for a minute. She says, you know, I'm, I am looking for a true companion, Jill. 
someone that I can connect with on a higher level, you know, someone who knows how to communicate, uh, who wants to meet for a coffee. And uh, I want to be able to look into her eyes for the eyes I do believe are the, the window to the soul. And she went on to say, you know, I I hope to find someone who effortlessly puts a smile to my face. Someone I could call a friend and see where this leads us. That we become best friends and listen to each other and learn from each other and always have each other's backs. We love and care for each other through good times and not so good times. We feel comfortable like wearing a good pair of fitting shoes, just the right fit. We believe in God together and travel together and build a beautiful home together. Empathy, respect, dignity, clarity, thirst for knowledge about each other, passion, holding hands and kisses and hugs, enjoy common interests together. She had such a thoughtful answer. I loved her answer and I responded with, you know, the talk of presence and being in alignment with self and how two people with, that are in alignment can do anything together. You know, she told me that being single for four years and loving herself and her family and her daughter and, you know, taking time to travel and appreciate so much that she felt ready to find the special woman to walk this journey with. You know, We talked about our dating experience, and again, she said that Freya, her daughter, was instrumental in getting her to give it a try. I told her that, uh, I told her to thank Freya because I felt like I might possibly be able to meet these requirements, ha, 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 you know, kind of jokingly, but I wasn't joking because I felt like I could meet those requirements. Um, I kind of told her a little bit of the red devil nightmare and... You know, that was my only internet situation. And uh, she couldn't really understand why I didn't have a manager or security to run my place in my absence. And, you know, I just didn't want to go into all those details. And I laughed and I said, you know, I'll save these details and stories for later. Ha ha ha, you know. And uh, she said she looked forward to hearing them and that she really liked the story so far. Um, so... You know, in all these talks and stuff, I I told her, I said, you know, I um, my birthday is in December. You know, I said, and we had been talking for maybe, you know, um, two months. And I said, what I'd really like is maybe I could, uh, and, you know, first, you know, backing up a little bit, we were both laughing about, like, how we met, how do you meet people, and that's why the whole online dating, and I said, you know, Helen, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I've never really asked anybody out in my life. Um, I said, you know, I've my last relationship, um, I kind of pursued this person. And eventually she gave me her number and said, OK, you can I'm going to text you my number and then you can call me. She was sort of like punching me in the face saying, call me. You know, which I did, you know, I did ask her to go have coffee, but it wasn't really like a formal date or asking anybody out or whatever. I just said I had never really had practice in that because of my generation, you know, and and I asked her, I said, you know, does it bother you that I'm 10 years older than you? And she laughed and was like, no, you know, she said, it's just a number. And she went on to tell me that her father had been quite a bit older than her mother and um, her mother was only 71, and uh, she was 49, so her mom had had her pretty early. But um, so when we were talking about this whole dating thing, you know, I said, well, you know, maybe maybe I'll come down to Charleston and maybe we can have coffee. And she, she said, uh, you would do that? You would come? on your birthday? And I said, yeah. And she says, that's an awfully sweet gesture. And she says, I find that very, very sweet. And I said, well, I'm a pretty sweet person. And, uh, and then I said, you know, there's a couple of places I know that I might could stay. Um, you know, one of them was like the Francis Marion Hotel. And then another was like a battery, the Battery Park Inn. It's kind of a haunted place. But I was kind of, you know, just kind of jabbing at a little bit and um and she got kind of quiet and then she said uh are you asking me out and I said kinda 
like that, kind of laughing, you know. And we were talking on the phone, and and she says, well, um, you know, I I would like to be able to give you a wholehearted yes. And when she said that, like it made me sick to my stomach. Like I was like, <gasps> and I said, oh. And she's and I said, well, I guess that's why I've never asked anybody out, kind of laughing. And she says, why is that? And I said, I guess fear of rejection. And she says, I am not rejecting you, Jill. She says, I am just telling you that I, I want to be able to, to give you 100% yes. And, you know, in my mind, I was like, Jill, like, grow up. Quit being a fucking baby teenager here. You know, this woman is telling you that, you know, she wants to be able to, she, maybe she's not that into you. And then, of course, I start spiraling inside of myself. But I played it cool. I was like, okay. I said, yeah, 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 that's fine. Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, and, you know, and, and I was dying inside because I was thinking, oh, my God, did I just blow it? You know, did I just now blow it? And then she went on to say, she said, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in a situation and it took me years to overcome and to get myself back and I get to choose and I get to make these decisions. Do you understand that? And I said, absolutely, I understand it because I, I too had been in the situation where I didn't have, I didn't feel like I had much of a choice a lot of times and I get that. And so she says, are we good? And I said, we're good. I'm good. You know, so it was kind of like a little moment and it kind of made my heart kind of hurt. But, you know, she said that, you know, she looked forward to hearing more of my stories, um, but that her back was beginning to hurt and uh, and she was going to go to bed, but then we talked a little bit about um, yoga and stretching, and she said, you know, I'm so glad to know that you meditate and do yoga, Jill. She said, you know, I have to do these things to stay on top of things in my work and to stay grounded, uh, and this was like music to my ears, you know. I felt like we could just talk forever. It was so nourishing and so nurturing. Um, I felt so at peace and so satisfied you know I remember saying uh, this is such a good conversation that we're having and uh, and we were getting ready to hang up you know and I just there was so much more I wanted to say and so right when we were hanging up she said good night beautiful and my heart felt like it was just gonna explode Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates. 